Uh, we're going to be going now to Robin and Neil uh, Hayden's garden in Alameda. They have a small lot and this is the before photo. Uh, they sheet mulch their lawn and remove the um, non-natives in the border beds. You remember I talked about agapanthus earlier, has zero value for wildlife, same with the lawn. They worked with uh, two different designers who specialized in designing native plant gardens. And some of the plants they put in, island bush poppy, the bush anemone. And one thing I found really interesting about Robin's garden was she had had in it originally Mexican feather grass. You've probably seen this, probably in places seen a lot of it because it's invasive and it spreads readily. Uh, Robin originally had some Mexican feather grass in her garden and when she realized that it was an invasive plant uh, from plant right. Uh, she took it out and planted a neighbor, a native in its place. So here's a, a screenshot from a plant right um, handout. You can see they're talking about the invasive grasses, green fountain grass, Mexican feather grass, pompous grass. If you have any of those, we would encourage you to take them out. And here are suggested non-native, uh, suggested non-invasive alternatives. Not all of these are natives. You just need to check and see what is, but at least they give you suggestions for better choices than those um, grasses. This is a photo from uh, Robin's back garden, lovely little garden in uh, Alameda. And now, um, whoops, without further ado, let's go see Robin and... Hi Robin, how are you? Good morning, Kathy. I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I understand you're in Washington State right now. Yes, that's right. You're very versatile. <laughs> so um, I know you worked with two different garden designers on your front and back gardens, respectively. How did you find them and how, how did it go? Uh, right, yes. I worked um, uh, with Liz Simpson in the front garden and Jude Hawley in the back garden. And um, I found them both actually through you and through the, the tour. Um, so I went back when we were going to gardens uh, in person, um, the gar I found the gardens that I really liked were designed by those two women. Um, and uh, Liz Simpson and my husband and I worked together on the front garden first. And then unfortunately Liz moved away. And so when I, we decided a few years later to do the back garden, um, I got in touch with Jude Hawley and she worked with me out there. Um, and they were both fabulous. Uh, the key, you know, for both of them, they, they had sort of a design sense that I really admired and, and seemed to match what I was looking for. But they also were very knowledgeable about California natives and that made a huge difference. Um, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of garden designers might bill themselves as being knowledgeable about native plants, but you know, it, they may be native plants to other areas or they may bring in drought tolerant plants or whatever, but not necessarily California natives. And so both Jude and Liz were, were very good about that as well as having a great, uh, just a great sense of landscape design. Good, so let me follow up and say that if you go to the Garden Tours website and look under Find a Designer, you'll see a list of designers there that specialize in designing native plant gardens. And if you can, uh, underneath their contact information, you'll see links to the gardens they have designed. So you can really look through a portfolio of their work and try to find somebody whose who's sense of design looks like something that you would like in your own garden. Um, so let's go now, Robin, and see your video. Okay. Hello, I'm Robin Hayden, and I'm recording this in March of 2021. Normally, around this time of year, we'd be getting ready to meet in person at the Bringing Back the Natives garden tour. But given the year we're having, we'll instead record this garden tour digitally. I'm gonna take you on a tour of our home garden at 2500 San Jose Avenue in Alameda. I'm gonna take you through our front, back and side gardens, but don't worry. It won't take long because our property is really small. Like a lot of houses in Alameda, we have a tiny front yard and a tiny backyard. So our garden is actually a good one to take a look at if you're thinking about planning for small spaces. As I take you through our front and back gardens, these are some of the things I'm going to be talking about. And one thing I wanna mention right up front 
is the importance of making a garden that you're planning your own to find some special feature or some special something that is uniquely yours and will make your garden special for you. For me, that was mosaics. I do, uh, I make mosaics, mostly the mosaics that I make are for indoors, but I decided when we were planning our garden that I would create a few outdoor mosaics to, to nestle in amongst the plants. So as you're looking through these pictures, um, I'll, uh, I'll point them out where I can. So let's start with the front garden. This is what our house looked like when we bought it in 2012. As you can see, it had a fairly traditional lawn and trees and a big cement sidewalk up to the front door. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted, but I knew I didn't want a lawn in, in a drought state of California. And I didn't like the cement walkway much. And it was around that time that I went to my first Bringing Back the Natives garden tour and was introduced to the importance of planting native plants and all the benefits that that brings. I also sat in on a sheet mulching workshop and learned all about that. So that gave me a lot of ideas for what I wanted to do next. So the first thing we did was remove the trees and the grass uh, we wanted to remove that cement walkway and we decided to sheet mulch. And for those of you who have done this or participated in the workshop, you, these pictures will look familiar. So we did this in the winter of 2013 and then just let it percolate for a couple of months until we were ready to plant. Here's what it looked like with all the mulch on top. And you can see in the picture on the right, we've removed the cement walkway. Also at that native plant uh, tour, we met the gardener, Liz Simpson, who's pictured here on the right. And um, I liked a lot of the gardens that Liz had designed and started talking with her and we decided to work together on our front garden. She uh, drew up the plans that you see on the left, including an irrigation plan that you see on the tissue layer on the top. And that's, uh, that's her pictured with the plants that we decided upon. And here's Liz um, installing the hardscape. We went with Hamilton Gray Select paving stones and uh, Napa Basalt Occasional Rocks with some PAMI cobbles um, sprinkled in between the Hamilton Gray. So here she is plotting out like giant puzzle pieces what the look of that walkway is gonna be. And here are the plants in position, ready to go. Uh, in hindsight, we probably overplanted this little patch. You'll see in some of the later photos that are more current day, the garden is quite full. Um, I think we could have gotten away with planting a little bit less, um, but it's hard to tell, you know, when you're starting. Um, but it is important to keep in mind how big the plants are going to get um, when you're deciding how many to put in. So here's what it looked like with everything planted and all the hardscape installed. Right at, This was right after we finished. We also have these side strips. Our house is a corner house, so we have this other gardening opportunity in the little strip between the sidewalk and the street. And so we carried through the same themes there, some of the same plants and those same Hamilton Gray um, slate stones. Um, but the plants here had to be pretty hardy because it gets a lot of wear and tear. Cars park here, people open doors on plants, step on things. So we had to have things that were gonna really stand up to that. So we ended up planting a lot of manzanita in this strip, which worked out really well. We have about four species of manzanita in the, in the, in the gardens. Um, but I also made a mistake here, and I'm wondering if those of you who are nat more familiar with native plants recognize the mistake I made. It's that plant that you see right in the foreground, Mexican feather grass. Here's a closer look at that. Um, I liked this plant. I liked the look of it. It kind of looked like mermaid hair. I thought it was very pretty. Um, but as soon as I got it in, I realized the mistake. It was an invasive species, and I didn't know that. Um, and I, once I realized it, I ripped it all out. But I can tell you that was in 2014 that I put that plant in, and I am still to this day in 2021 finding uh, little sprouts of Mexican feather grass in my garden. So uh, once it's in, it's hard to eradicate. So definitely one you want to avoid. 
And here's the house a few years later uh, when the plants had um, gotten a little larger and everything had filled in. And that red arrow there is pointing out one of the mosaics. Um, I did these as on stepping stones and pl planned them right into the uh, walkway right along with the Hamilton Gray. And I see them every time I go in and out the door and it's just kind of my little signature on the garden. Here's a side by side before and after view, before on the left, after on the right, to give you an idea of how it's changed. Now let's take a look at the back garden. So this one we did a few years later in 2016. You can see the back garden for the house really wasn't much of a garden. It was really more of a deck. Um, we had this large crumbling deck that pretty much took up the whole space. And so our plan was to dismantle the deck and remove it and, and reclaim some of the ground underneath for planting. When we started the plan for this, Liz Simpson was no longer living in California, so we had to find a new garden designer, and Jude Hawley was um, our, our designer of choice for this, and she was wonderful to work with. She's terrific. Um, that's her picture on the right. And then that's uh, Bob Otterson on the left, who was, is a builder, and he was going to take apart the old deck and build the new deck. I included this picture in the slideshow because it was exactly this kind of collaboration that really made a difference on, the, on our project. They had never met before, and so I asked them to meet together with me so that we could plot things out um, and, and have the gardening plan influence the deck and vice versa. And I also wanted to get the plan in place for the irrigation system because I knew it would impact both. Um, and it turned out that that collaboration early on in the planning stages was really helpful and uh, changed, um, changed a lot of the, uh, uh, the things we ended up doing. Here's the drawing that Jude did for our back garden. And here's Bob beginning to take apart the old deck, the demolition. And there's the waste. There was a lot there, an amazing amount of wood and cement for such a tiny place. And it turned out that there was more than we even thought. Underneath the deck, there was a lot of cement, old cement stairs, the base of an old hot tub, and that all had to be jackhammered out and removed. Uh, this ended up taking us a lot longer than we thought it was going to. But we eventually got it all out of there, and this is what it looked like when it was clear. Uh, we also had to remove that brick that you see, which my husband and I did brick by brick. Here's the new deck going in. And here's the new deck complete. We uh, decided to have one side of the new deck be a, a raised vegetable bed uh, with a kind of seating, sitting rail along the edges. And you can see that we lined the, the planter box with waterproofing membrane. And um, if you look in the picture on the right, you can just see a piece of irrigation hose there. Uh, and this is a good example of the collaboration between Bob the contractor and Jude the garden designer. She was right there on the day that he was finishing this vegetable uh, box so that she could wire in the right size irrigation disc, uh, uh, irrigation hose at the right place for the plan that she had in mind. And it's exactly that kind of cooperation that made such a difference. And there's the finished deck. That uh, lattice work, that wooden lattice work actually removes in panels so you can get underneath the deck for storage. And uh, Bob fashioned a little door as well, a little secret door in the side of the deck so that you have a second access point for underneath the deck. I also wanted to have a potting shelf or a potting table, but we don't have a lot of space back there. So we came up with this idea of having a foldable potting shelf, which actually works out really well. Uh, it's in its folded up state, state on the left and its open state on the right. Um, and I end up using this a lot, not just for potting, but for other things too. It's extremely useful. Here we are putting in the hardscape for the back, and we use the same materials, front and back, to have uh, some continuity. And 
and here's the hardscape installed. And here are the plants. Again, for continuity's sake, we planted a, many of the same natives between the front and the back with a few variations back here. Um, this was something I really wanted to try in that tiny backyard space. I wanted to get a little uh, experiment with a little vertical garden. And so we built a frame for this vertical garden in the fence, which you can see in the bottom right hand picture. And then I purchased these plastic, these plastic um, vertical garden pieces. Uh, there's four of them. Uh, each one has 25 slots for plants. So altogether it's 100, 100 little slots for plants. And you put a little potting soil in each pocket. Uh, the, 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 each pocket is kind of slanted so the plant stays in and doesn't fall out. Um, and then you stuff the plant in. in. And um, we ran a uh, irrigation hose um, up the side and across the top and the water sort of percolates through from top to bottom. That's how it stays watered. Um, I play around with this vertical guard quite a bit, actually. I take things out and try something else. Something dies, I replace it. Um, it's tricky to get the right kind of plant in here because those little pockets are quite small, so the plants dry out pretty quickly. This is a really sunny spot, too, so only certain plants will do well there. Um, so I've played with succulents. I've tried ground cover. I've tried mosses. Uh, mosses don't work so well. They dry out pretty quickly. Um, you don't want anything that's going to get any height to it because you want it to keep it kind of flush to the to the vertical space. Um, so I think of this as kind of a living mosaic. I just kind of play with the pieces and, and reorganize it. Here's what it looked like finished, all planted the first time. And there's another view of it. And here's the back garden when it was just first finished. There's the raised vegetable bed. And here's what the garden looks like today. That picture on the right is actually fairly recent. Um, and there's one more thing I want to point out there in, in the picture on the right, and that is the another mosaic. Um, this one's called a pebble cast mosaic. And these are actually pretty easy to do. You just use some bender board and arrange stones in a pattern that, that's, that you like, and then you cover it with cement. Um, and so these are pictures I took while I was building that, and it makes for a nice feature in, in the hardscape. So that's our garden, front, back, and side. And I'll conclude with a list of the common names of the native plants that we planted. Um, and I thank you very much for coming to see my garden today, and I hope we get a chance to um, meet in person one day and perhaps talk a little bit. All right, well, Robin, thank you so much. I wanna say Robin is among the many hosts who learned how to make videos just for this uh, tour, and I know it was not easy. So thank you for that, it was terrific. I have some questions for you in the time that we have available. So before I go into the questions, let me, so I don't forget, say that, if you go to the find a designer list on the tours website, uh, you will see Liz Chin's name. So hello, Liz. I know that you uh, are with us right now, uh, even from the state of Washington. Um, but um, you can see Liz Chin's uh, a listing there. And I left her there even though she's moved because the gardens were so beautiful that um, I, I thought you might want to see them. We're going to have to take Pete off of screen sharing because I have something else coming up before Pete goes on. Um, and then Pete, you might want to mute yourself till, it's, till we call on you. Um, let's see, so that's a, a charming garden. Um, let me say that if you're interested in sheet mulching, I saw a lot of questions about cardboard and sheet mulching. If you go to the Tours YouTube channel, uh, in the 2020 videos, there's a half an hour long presentation on sheet mulching. I used to run sheet mulching workshops with Kelly Marshall. Robin came to one many years ago. Uh, so that'll tell you about cardboard and wood chips and where to get it and what kind. I could talk about cardboard all day long. <laughs> um, people love the foldable potting shelf. So did I. Uh, somebody asked about maintenance. Like how much time do you spend on your garden? Like a week and a month or whatever. That's a good question. It, it, I probably spend more more time out there than you know is required strictly required by the space and the demands of the garden. It's mostly that I just like to be out there, nice. so uh, I'm out there most weekends. You know, for an hour or so. You know, just 
pulling weeds and checking on things and putting in new plants and fussing around with, with things, but it's really very low maintenance. A uh, little bit of pruning, a little bit of weed pulling. Um, some, you know, I, I do have to irrigate when I'm putting in new plants. There is an irrigation system that's in there, but you know, it, 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 it's pretty, pretty, it pretty much takes care of itself. Do you water your garden anymore? I do. And I, I was interested to hear Al say that in the, just the last one uh, that he doesn't unless, unless he's putting in new plants. And, and I'm, I'm, it's making me think that maybe I should be cutting back. Uh, Alameda soil is very sandy. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, it, it, and, and it's wind, a little windier there. So I think things tend to dry out a little bit more. But um, I did have some manzanitas die on me this year. And I'm, I'm thinking that maybe I was overwatering them. Mm -hmm. I want to say that uh, my husband and I have not been living in our home for 10 months. And so it's been a year since we've done any work on our garden at all. We yeah. haven't watered once. We haven't weeded or pruned or deadheaded or anything. We just moved back into our house after a big remodel. And I have to say the garden looks amazing. <laughs> not to say that people, any, that everybody could get away with that, but um, our garden is established and... Um, it's, it's really astonishing to me, like how great it looks after a year of no care at all. Yeah. And Liz is making a good point in the chat that mulch and close planting does help to keep the weeds down a lot. You know, um, Liz had a really good idea of using some Platts Black, which is this fabulous ground cover that I just love. And she put just a little bit of it in between flagstones uh, on the walkway and that has spread beautifully. And boy, that blocks out all kinds of weeds. And so that front area where I had a lot of stone is now pretty much between all the stones. It's all mm -hmm. that that's black and it's, it's wonderful. And then the mulch takes, takes care of a lot of it too. I had um, yarrow grow up between my flagstones and it was just a hot, hot place between these big hot stones in the full sun. But the yarrow spread in there by itself and it was a perfect, um, it was a perfect, uh, filler for between the stones because it was a harsh enough environment that it didn't flower so we could still walk over the path but it still was green and beautiful all year long so that was a nice find in our yard. Uh, someone asked if you could um, tell us your handful of maybe your top foolproof native plants like what do you really rely on and enjoy and find easy in your garden? Right yeah I think that was Rebecca right she asked about that. Um, and I think, you know, I have so many favorites, but the ones that have really been hardy and that have given me no problem at all, uh, those, those bush poppies, those anemones, those, man, those things are hardy. And they're on the um, strip between the street and the sidewalk. So they get a lot of rough treatment, you know, people opening their car doors on them and kids riding bikes through them and everything. And they seem to survive just fine. Um, same with manzanitas for the most part, other than the few that I had that I think I overwatered. Um, and I have like three different kinds of manzanitas. And so that, that's nice in thinking about Al's point about having uh, continuity and, you know, um, repetition, having a, a I, have, I have a lot of manzanita and, but different kinds. And so it's, they're, they're all the, you know, sort of have a similar look, but slight variations. And that's a nice, um, that's a nice thing. Um, uh, the yerba buena, yeah, I have, it's very hardy and that, covers nicely on the ground. Um, uh, Ceanothus, super hardy. Somebody asked about small plants for their garden. So I wanna say that you can go onto the tours website, look under agenda for today, and you can go right to Robin's garden, or you could look under the view of the 2021 gardens and you'll get to her garden again. Her plant list is there. And one thing I've really enjoyed about your garden is that you have these diminutive plants that are just perfect for your charming small garden. They, you know, really were selected so well uh, for, for the space that was there. Yeah, really helps working with a designer, you know, because they, they know what the plants are going to look like when they're big and full grown. And they understand this idea. Of, I learned a lot about that from Liz, you know, about this idea of repeating and never having just one of a plant, you know, but having two or three or four of them and, and um, mixing it up. Yeah, I can't say enough that I think if people, I certainly tried to design my own garden in my front yard and my backyard, and it was pr a pretty disastrous failure. I, I tried for like 10 years, you know, it never looked good. And uh, I just think designing a garden is, it's, it's really challenging. You know, we wouldn't design our own homes. People spend a lot of time yeah. learning, you know, what plant 
uh, light needs are and water and um, what will look good together and how big they're going to get when they're full size. And working with a designer just gives you so much a better shot at having a beautiful and successful garden. Exactly. Well, Robin, I want to thank you so much for taking the time and making that great video. And will you stay with us in case there are any questions on Zoom? And I don't know if you can hop over to YouTube, but there might be some questions there as well. Okay, great. Going to. All right, thank you so much, Robin. Thank, thank you. you. I'm gonna share my screen now before we go to Pete. And all right, so uh, this is a, a, a word from a sponsor. So would you raise your hand if you're on Zoom, if you're of an age when you remember your dad or mom warming up the car before they started driving? I am, but I learned recently that if your car is idling for more than 30 seconds, it's better to turn the car off and turn it back on again than to leave it running. And Mike, my video is like charging ahead. These screens are advancing all by themselves. Let me go back here. Ah, okay. So you can save gas, save money and spare the air. But Mike, can you help me? These slides are like leaping ahead. They're not supposed to. Uh, by turning off your car's engine, if you'll be idling for more than 30 seconds, you'll be protecting your and your family's health, saving money on gas, and as car exhaust is the number one source of air pollution in the Bay Area, you'll be helping to keep our skies blue. If you're waiting to pick someone up from school, sports practice, or the library, if you're sitting at a drive through or a car wash, just turn your engine off. You can learn more at idlefreebayarea.org. Okay, let's hope that that crazy advancing has stopped now. And 